The, uh, uh, I, I really, I did, I loved them. But one time I had uh, my son Sam in the, the house that we were in, uh, he was very, very little. My, the house that we were in had a basement with a concrete floor. And uh, we had one of those, you remember those little walkers that they used to have before they were all banned because everybody, kids were getting hurt in them? Um, we had one of those, and they were great. You know, you could set the kid in them. They were surrounded by a piece of plastic with wheels on it. Um, and and we, had, we had him downstairs, so the stairs weren't going to come into play. I think that's kind of where the, their downfall was, uh, literally. And, uh, and I had him down there. I was trying to put him in one of those strollers, and, and they kind of had a little cloth strap that you had to set him in. And he was wiggling and that kind of thing, and I dropped him on his head on the concrete. Wasn't one of my better moments. Thankfully, the Lord intervened, and, and he's fine. Um, no permanent damage that we can tell, although his sisters might protest that. They might think that there might have been. But it was a, uh, it, it, you know, just one of those moments where you're going, man, I just, I failed. That, that, uh, that wasn't good. And yet, they honor me anyway. Sam already texted me this morning. My daughters are both, uh, my daughters are both here today to, to be with me on Father's Day, and I so appreciate that. Uh, love them, love them like crazy. I don't know how you do Father's Day at your house. I know some fathers like to spend some time out in the yard working and getting some of their stuff done because that's what charges them up as dad. Others like to uh, hit the recliner, right, and, and the remote and just have people bring you stuff. Uh, I'm good with that one. Personally, I like, uh, I like that. If a man's home is his castle, then the recliner is the throne, right? That's, uh, that's kind of where you sit. Uh, and that's, that's, the, that's the way we'll, uh, we may do Father's Day today. Uh, we got some other plans too, but, but that's, that's the fun part. We're going to be spending a lot of time talking about thrones through this sermon series. In fact, the centerpiece of our staging is, uh, is set up to be a throne, to look like a, a throne. Maybe not one that a, that a king would set on, and certainly the, the crown hanging on it is not a traditional kind of crown, but we serve a different king don't we? And when we think about the crown that he wore, the crown with which he was given the kingdom of heaven was a crown of thorns. The throne that he sat in, that he was on, was, was a cross. And he's a very different kind of king. We're going to spend some time talking about that. What I want you to keep in mind, and I'd love to hear your comments, your thoughts, your feedback on this, because I certainly don't have all the answers, but here's what I want to know. Here's what I'm searching for as I go through this series. And, and the big question is, what is the kingdom of God? When Jesus talks about it, he starts his, his ministry in, in, in the book of Mark, telling people the kingdom of God is coming near. The kingdom of God is on its way, it's approaching. He does it with a sense of urgency, uh, that, that it required action on their part, repenting, recommitting, reconnecting with God because his kingdom is Near. What did he mean by that? What was that kingdom going to look like? I don't know what comes to your mind when you think of the concept of a kingdom. But I think of, a, I think of King Arthur and, the, and the, his court, the, round, the knights of the round table, swords and horses and lances and that kind of a thing. I think culturally that's kind of our idea of a kingdom and what it looked like. However, when Jesus talked about kingdom, that would have been a very different, what would have brought up a very different image or imagination from the people of his day. No doubt when he talked about the kingdom of God, their minds went to the kingdom of David. David was their king. He was the, the royal, the, the all-star, the rock star, uh, the one everyone could have known about. The very symbol of Judaism is the star of David. He's the one that set the standard, set the precedent for what all kingdoms, God's kingdom, should look like in their minds. So no doubt they were thinking, in term, when Jesus talked about the kingdom of God, they were thinking of this Messiah that God had promised. And in their imagine what they had been taught is that when this, the Messiah came, he would restore the kingdom to David. So they were looking for someone who came through the line of David. Jesus did. They were looking for someone who would run the enemies away from Israel and would set up a, an earthly kingdom, would overthrow the powers that were at that time. He would set up his kingdom here on earth. Israel would again be a sovereign nation, and they would take their place 
in the table of nations, a place of respect and a place of, of, uh, of sovereignty, a place that they, where they ruled themselves. And that was something that they longed for, that they craved, that they expected. And so when Jesus said the kingdom of God is near, that's what their imagination went to. And they began to follow him because, initially at least, because they believed that he was ushering in these messianic times. He was, and he told, but he told them many times, this isn't going to go down the way you think it will. Things are, this is going to be a different kind of thing. And as we come to today and I ask, what is the kingdom of God? I'm guessing most of us still looked and thought, you know, I know some things about it, but a lot of mystery and cloaked around this concept of the kingdom of God. So what we're asking through this lesson series, as we study the kingdom of David, and we'll look at the early part of King Solomon as well, what can we learn from what the Bible tells us about the kingdom of David that helps us understand what Jesus meant about the kingdom of God, what that looked like? And today, the lesson is, what we're going to learn is what Jesus was saying about who is on the throne. What does it look like? in the kingdom of God, to have someone on the throne. What can we learn from this? So we come to the point of Israel's history where David is anointed as the king of Israel. Lots gone on to that point. We talked uh, in an earlier series uh, through the winter months about the book of Exodus and how God called the people out of Exodus and with a mighty hand defeated the Egyptians uh, without them even doing anything. In fact, he told them at one time, just be still. God will fight for you. And they watched as God defeated the armies of Egypt, which was the most powerful army at the time. And they went on to the Mount to Mount Sinai where God spoke to them from the from the fire that was on the mountain. And as he spoke to them, he gave them these ten commandments that we still know and talk about today, saying, Here's how you live if you're going to be my people. He called them at that point in time, says, I want to make of you a holy nation, a royal priesthood, or a nation of priests. I want that to be your identity and who you are because I want you to serve me and me alone. And that's what he was calling Israel to do as they went forward. Well, we know the story. They fell several times in the wilderness as they were, as they were heading towards this promised land that God was giving them, given to them. They complained all along the way and held Moses responsible for their suffering. God continued to be faithful. They came to the, to the edge of the promised land and they sent the spies in and, and they looked over the land and the spies, most of them coming back saying, hey, the people there are just too big. I don't know what God's thinking when he says we can take these people, but we can't. It's just not possible. You and I sit and ask, how can you see Egypt getting wiped out with the hand of God, and you do nothing and say, this is impossible, we can't do this. But somehow they did. God said, because of your faithlessness, you're going to wander for 40 years in the wilderness. You're going to spend some wilderness time. And in that time, a whole generation is going to die off, and this next generation I'll send into the promised land. And that's exactly what happened. 40 years of wandering, a generation dies. They come back to the edge of the promised land. Moses isn't able to go in. Aaron isn't able to go in. Uh, Joshua is the leader that takes them into the promised land. And one by one, they begin to capture these cities and fight these kings until they take the entire, nearly the entire land that God had promised them. They were a little lazy towards the end and didn't take it all. And that would come back to bite them later. But they set up this kingdom of Israel And for a while they were served by judges, one godly man who would go from place to place bringing God's word to them. Many judges would deliver them from from the hands of people that that had overtaken them because they had become faithless and began to worship idols. God would give them over to the enemies and then a judge would be raised up, would defeat their enemies uh, and, and take over them. Gideon was one of those judges. Samson was one of those judges. Deborah was one of those judges. The last of those judges then was Samuel. Samuel judged Israel, and and we'll see in just a minute the effect of the impact that that he had on Israel, a very godly man, as he went and and did God's work among the Israelites, making sure that they were continuing in the paths and in the plans of God, helping them to become the people that they needed to be. But that wasn't good enough. Though Samuel continued to help them to overcome their enemies, it wasn't good enough for them. And so in chapter 8 of 1 Samuel, 
Israel comes to Samuel and says, listen, we want you to set a king over us. Can you imagine what that had to have felt like for Samuel? After all he had done for them, giving his life in service to them, they're saying, Samuel, you're just not good enough. We're seeing all these nations around us. They have kings. We want a king too. Set a king over us to protect us. You'll read it, if you read in the bulletin this morning, the article that I, that I wrote about that, it wasn't that Israel thought that God couldn't protect them. They just weren't sure that he would protect them. And so they wanted a king to be over them in case God let them down, in case God was going to call them into some kind of suffering, perhaps their king would rescue them. It didn't work out so well. The first king that was appointed over them was King Saul. And we know that King Saul was a, was a, had a lot of good intentions. He was a very humble man to begin with. Didn't want the job to begin with. In fact, when they went to anoint him, they had to go look for him. He was hiding among the supplies. And yet they, they anointed him as king through a couple of, of armed conflicts. He established himself as king, and he began to reign in Israel as their first king. Didn't take long, though, for things to go sour with Saul. He was fighting against the Philistines. And there was a... There was a a law, a rule where he had to wait for Samuel to come and offer a, a sacrifice where, and then he would, he would uh, ask of the Lord if, if he should go and fight this battle. And God would either give him permission to fight it or, or he would send a message saying, no, you shouldn't stay back. The men were beginning to scatter. Saul was nervous that he was going to lose his army. And so he began to, to, to fret. He finally said, hey, bring me the sacrifice. I'll make the sacrifice and ask of the Lord because Samuel hadn't shown up yet. And about the time he's making the sacrifice, Samuel comes and he's angry. Why are you doing this? You know this isn't the way it's supposed to go down. It's not what God told you. But Samuel, you were running late and my men were running around. I had to do something. Samuel says, because you've acted so, God has removed the kingdom before you. And this is a, 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 an allusion to what's going to happen. He says, God has selected for himself a man after his own heart. A man who's going to follow him with all of his heart because Saul had already begun to go astray. Let's go to that first side. The, uh, the second thing Saul does as he continues his reign and, and we see him getting further and further away from the Lord. The, uh, the, the uh, Amalekites are a problem. And God says, I want you to destroy them. They've not, they've, they were bad to the people, to my people earlier on, and I've told them that I promised them destruction, and I'm, I want you to destroy them completely. And this is one of those times where God meant completely. Kill everyone, kill all the animals that they own, everything is to be laid waste. So Saul takes his army in and begins the attack, but instead of taking everything, he takes the king and, and puts him in chains, but keeps him alive. King Agag is his name. He also takes some of the choice, allows the men to take some of the choicest animals. Some of the animals that they could take back as their own, later he'll say that they were for sacrifices. But he allows them to bring some of the spoils of war. Samuel comes again. Says, Saul, what have you done here? I'm hearing animals in the background. I don't believe you brought any animals with you. Where'd you get those? Didn't God tell you to destroy everything? I think it's interesting what Saul does here. He says to Samuel, hey, I did what the Lord said. I went in and attacked, and I killed everyone <clears throat> except the king. I, I kept him, but eventually we'll get to him. And I also allowed the men, some of the men were going to take it, the, some of the animals for themselves to, to make their sacrifices. I was afraid of them, and so I let them do that. Saul's points are fairly legitimate in a worldly situation. These soldiers, most of these soldiers were volunteers. And so they went into the battle because the spoils were their pay. God essentially said, I want you to go into this battle and kill everything. In other words, you get no spoils. You get nothing from them. You just have to do my word. You just have to do what I told you to do. So they wanted to... They, took some of the animals as their own. They took those back. You get the sense that, that that's a big thing to ask, to ask them to leave those things, those material possessions, 
Animals were wealth at that time to leave that on the table. And some of them didn't, and Saul allowed it. So when Samuel saw that, he said, listen, God has taken your kingdom from you and given it to another. In other words, Saul, you're done. It's just a matter of time. God has taken your kingdom from you and from your family, and he's given it to another. Saul grabbed him by, the, by, by his garment as he was walking away, and his garment tore, and Samuel looked at him, and I, I would imagine an angry way said, just like that, God's torn your kingdom from you. It's final. There's no going back on that. That's what's said, and that's what's going to happen. I think it's interesting the fact, and I think we need to take note of this fact this morning, that Saul, in his defense, said, I did what the Lord said. How many of you have had teenagers who did that technical obedience thing, right? I did what you said, and what they mean is kind of, right? They, they didn't do it all, but they, they did it technically. I can show you technically where I tried to do what you told me to do, and that's Saul's defense here. I basically did what God said. Ah, there's some little variations here, but I basically did it clearly, clearly in this situation. Partially following God's will is not following God's will at all. That's how he views it. Just doing a little, just doing enough to kind of get you what you want is not going to be enough. It's clear in this situation that as God defined, discerned Saul's heart, he saw that Saul would, would comply to a point, but he was going to get what he wanted to. He was blending God's will and his will, and when he does that, it's not really God's will. You see, God calls his leaders in this situation, as he does all of his people, to be all in to give up our will and to give that over to his will so that he is the one that's in charge. That when he says, do this, you do it. When he says, love like I do, you do it. When he says, treat people as I would treat them, handle money as I would handle money, you do it. God wants us to be people who follow him with all of our hearts, not just our minds. In our minds, we can do the technical thing. With our hearts, if our hearts are in love with him, we're going to follow him heart and soul. And it's why when God looked for someone else to be the king of Israel, he said, I found a man who is after my own heart. In other words, he's all in, heart and soul. My will is going to come first. As we, as we look at the life of David We'll, we'll know and we'll find that David did not do this perfectly. That he was not always one to follow God's will perfectly. But his heart was about trying. It was about trying to do the right thing regardless. And it's what he strove, it's what he always strove to be. In chapter 16, when Samuel went to anoint David, and I think it's interesting as, it, as he enters the town of, of Bethlehem, it says that the elders of the town came up to him and says, do you come in peace? And it says that they were trembling. It gives us a little sense of how Saul was, or Samuel was revered at this time. That as he's walking the, the, uh, from city to city, that at times he came and the news he brought was not good news. You've not, you've not been pleasing to God. You need to make some changes. You need to correct things. God is not pleased with you. You wonder how many times he had to deliver that message. And so when the elders of Bethlehem came and said, do you come in peace? And Saul says, yes, I've just come to sacrifice. Whew, sigh of relief. Glad you've come to be with us. He took Jesse and invited him to come and make that sacrifice. And he knew it was one of Jesse's sons that would be God's chosen one. The oldest one, Eliab, came with Jesse to make the sacrifice. And when Samuel saw Eliab, he was a fine-looking man, strong-looking, tall, handsome. He said, surely this is the one. Surely the Lord's anointed stands before the Lord. God says something really, really interesting in that passage. As Eliab is standing there and Samuel is admiring him, 
God says, do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things people look at. The Lord does not look at the, people look at the outer appearance. The Lord looks at the heart. The Lord is asking the question, is your heart aligned with my heart? Does your heart want what you want? Does it want to grab what you want and get the gusto? Does it want to technically comply with what I ask and then you do what you want? Or are you going to do it all? God said, as for Eliab, I've rejected him. The other sons of Jesse came forward with, with similar results. They were all not chosen. And Samuel asked, isn't there another? Yes, the youngest, there is the youngest, but he's out tending the sheep. There was no way that the youngest was the one in their minds. And so they left him out with the sheep. Someone went to get him. Samuel said, we won't sit down until he's here. And when David walked in, God told Samuel, there he is. That's the one. Anoint him. And that's exactly what happened. Samuel anointed David, and David became the king to be, the king of Israel that was the chosen one. And through, we'll tell the story, but through a, a series of events, Saul was taken down, and David was put up as the king of Israel because of his heart. David's reign teaches us a little bit about what Jesus meant by the kingdom of God. And a lot of it has to do with who's on the throne. David served as kind of a priest king. Not a, king, not a priest in the sense of the Levites because they were given the, the priestly duties through the law. But, in the, but in, the, in the way that God told them that they would all be a royal priesthood, a, 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 a nation of priests. Peter later on said a royal priesthood. But he, uh, that concept of the nation of priests, David took that very seriously. And he, he was the one that wrote many of the Psalms or, or charged people to write the Psalms. They, were, they would be the hymns and the prayers of Israel throughout the time after he lived and continue to be often today as well as ours. David wrote the Psalms that praised God, that lifted him up, that talked about how miserable he was at times but continued to look to God and talked about the joy that he had in serving God. You see, when David was the king... The real ruler was never David. It was God. At least in his heart. Again, he didn't do this perfectly. We know that. We'll look at that. But in his heart, that was what David was committed to. And it's exactly what Saul was not committed to. Saul said, I'll serve God until it becomes inconvenient for me. I'll serve God until it seems kind of weird. And then I'm, I'm, then, then I'm going to go my way. I'll serve God until it deprives me of something that I desperately want, and then I'm going to do what I want. He didn't say it out loud, but his actions showed it. That's how he lived. When Saul was king, Saul was on the throne. When David was king, God was on the throne. The edicts of, David, of David's kingdom came from the commands of God and were based in the commands of God. And David was sure to see that no idols were, were worshipped, certainly not that he would confirm. David was sure to see that people walked with and followed God and led them in doing so. Again, it wasn't a perfect time, we know that, because no one's perfect. But David was called a man after God's own heart. Seeing David's response to God and how he lived his life and, and lived in his kingdom it tells us a little bit about how God would want us to live in his kingdom as well. Because the same question is asked of us as was asked of Saul and David with very different answers. Who's on the throne? In your life and in your walk and your family, around those whom you have authority or influence, who is on the throne? Is it you or is it God? See, who sits on the throne is an important question. When I sit on the throne of my life, when I make it my practice to be the ruler in my home and the ruler of my life, when I say what goes, it goes according to my will and what I want. I give ascension to God's will. I'm okay with God. I'm going to read it and I'm going to understand it, but, but when it becomes tough or when it becomes something that I don't want, there may be a different decision that I make. 
We're just as capable as Saul as keeping God's wishes partially. Oh, we'll go to church, but this making disciples thing, I don't know about. Yeah, I'll, I'll take food to the homeless and help out there, but, but when it comes to, to doing some of these other things, I'm just, I'm not really, that's not my calling, not into that. I love my kids and be with them like God wants me to, but other people's kids, yeah, I'm just not really called for that one. What's God telling us to do? You see, if, we're on, if we sit on our own throne, then it's up to us. It's up to our will. Oh, we can listen to God's will. We can, we can pay homage to God's will. We can even say, yeah, I'm all about doing God's will. But when you're filtering God's will through the filter of yours, of what you want, what seems right to you, then are you really doing God's will? I'll treat other people with kindness, but don't talk about my sexual choices. That's mine. I'm going to make those. I mean, that's what our culture is saying right now, right? Don't tell me what to do when it comes to my own relationships and my own choices. I get to do that. And God says, there's your throne. Have at it. What does it mean then to allow God to sit on the throne? It means I get up. I leave that throne and I ask God to have a seat. And I kneel before that throne and say, God, whatever you will, I will. If it seems weird, if it seems strange, if it's hard, if it involves people I don't like, people I don't get along with, if it means restraining the things that I want and giving to things that you want, then so be it. I bow to you. I give my life, my energy, and my all to your will because I'm putting you on the throne of my life. That's the difference between the kingdom of God and man's kingdom. Man says, I'm sitting on the throne. I'm gonna do what I want. But in God's kingdom, it's all about what he wants. It's all about his choices, his will, his rules. He gets to make them in the kingdom of God. He's sovereign. And if we're in the kingdom of God, <clears throat> we want to live in the kingdom of God, we follow his rules, not others. This morning, I invite you to ask that question. Go ahead and show that last slide. <clears throat> I invite you to ask that question. Who is on the throne? Who's on the throne of your life? Are you like Saul and kind of making your own picking and choosing, well, I'll do this part, but I'm not going to do this. I'll obey over here, but over there, you know, don't touch that. That's, that's not, that's mine. I'm going to make those decisions. Or is God on the throne? Because in the kingdom of God, God is on the throne. And if you live in the kingdom and you want to dwell with him in that kingdom and you want to give your life over to him, there's only one choice there. God is on the throne. This morning, I don't, if, if this stepped on your toes, let me tell you, it stepped on mine first. As I'm putting it together, because it's so easy to look at my life. You don't have to know me terribly well to look at my life and say, yeah, you know, there's some places where you need to do some things differently. Absolutely. Amen. I would guess for many of you it's the same. If this morning you've not put God on the throne of your life and you'd like to do so in a public way, we'd love to hear that. We'll have some men standing around during the invitation song who would love to pray with you, who would love to ask God with you to sit on the throne of your life and that you're committed to just doing his will and being what he wants you to be. If you've not yet surrendered your life to him, given your life over to him in baptism, calling on him to wash your sins away and taking him as your Lord and Savior. We'd like for you to do that this morning. That's a great way for you to take yourself off the throne and put him on it. Whatever you need to do this morning to put God on the throne of your life, to make him the sovereign ruler of his kingdom and to step into that, we wanna help you with it. Make that decision today.
And Paul's going to lead us a song. To encourage us to do that, let us know how we can help you with it as we stand and sing this song.